All right, well, good morning and welcome to Grace Chapel Baptist Church. We're delighted to have you here with us today. If you're our guest, we are delighted that you are you're with us. Uh, make sure you get some information from us before you leave. Michelle's been passing out packets. She's doing a great job staying on that. So if you don't have one, let us know. We'll get you a little bit of information about us. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Brother Gene. He's going to come give us some announcements and talk to us about what's going on in the life of the body. Tonight, during our PM service at 6, we will introduce prospective new members to Grace and hear their testimony. Next Sunday night, April 2nd, during our PM service at 6, we will vote on prospective new members to join the Grace family. Um, every Monday, we, uh, we have men's Bible study at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall. Next Saturday, uh, April 1st at 9 a.m., we'll do the big ministry breakfast and devotion. Um, then... February, or Friday, April 7th, Good Friday service, meal starting at 6.30. Easter Sunday service times, uh, we'll have sunrise service at 7.30. Then we'll have breakfast after that. Then we'll have Sunday school at 10. Um, and then we'll have Easter morning service at 11. And no PM service. So should be, most of that should be in your bulletins back there. So if you don't have one, pick one up. That being said, we'll turn it over to the priest. Thank you. Please stand.
You can be seated. We're going to spend just a minute uh, praying through some things in just the life of the church and the world around us. I'm going to do that from Psalm chapter 1. I'll read verses 3 through 6. It says, He, the blessed man, from the verse 1 we looked at last week, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaves do not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, in keeping with your word, it is our desire that we would be a stable that we would be a people built up, that we would be a people mature in our faith in you, Lord, that you would equip us for the work of ministry. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us your word to do just that. And so, Lord, we pray that you would make us a stable people, a people not tossed around by every wind and wave of doctrine, but a people conformed more and more to the image of your son. Lord, we pray that you would make us like a tree planted beside the stream. Lord, we pray that you would make us a fruitful people. Lord, we pray that, that our leaves would not wither, Lord, but that you would do your work that only you can do in our hearts. And that through doing that, Lord, we would be a people who live for you. That we would be a people who walk in wisdom, Lord. That we would be a people whose speech is seasoned with salt. Lord, that we would be a people who are quick to share your gospel. Lord, I pray that you would make us a gospel people, a gospel sharing people, a people who are, are quick to tell that you are worthy, your name should be praised, Lord, and that we'd be a people who are quick to praise, quick to tell others about you. Lord, we pray for work that needs to go on in the world uh, with your gospel. We pray for the Kumbi people this morning, a people group in India, 17 million people, and of that 17 million plus people, one half of 1% of them claim to know you. Lord, we pray as we join with others in praying for them today, Lord, we pray that you would get your gospel to those people, Lord, that you would make those just handful of people, Lord, that you would make them bold and faithful and living out their faith in the middle of a society that knows nothing of the faith, in the middle of a, of a society that is intimidated by any thought of Christianity, Lord, we pray that you would be at work in that people group. This morning, Lord, we pray that you would mobilize your people to get the gospel to those people who so desperately need it. Lord, we pray also for the gospel work in, in our community, in our midst. Lord, we pray for our friend and for our brother, Pastor Clay Jones, this morning, as he stands up at Central Baptist Church in Gaffney, South Carolina, to preach 2 Corinthians this morning. Lord, I pray that you would fill him with the power of your spirit. Lord, I pray that he would preach as a dying man to dying men. Lord, I pray that he would make it plain and clear how... Sinners can come to know and trust you. Lord, we pray for the preaching of the word here this morning as we, your people, gathered at Grace Chapel Baptist Church are just a few minutes away from the time where we will turn to your word and we will open it up. Lord, I pray that you would go before us. Lord, that your spirit would illumine our minds and our hearts. Lord, that we might be a people with ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, would you cause us to see what you've stored up for us in your word and only what you have stored up for us in your word. Lord, that we might be a more faithful people. Lord, may your gospel go forth, and may you have your will and your way among us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Join us as we sing the old Red Cross.
Well, before I introduce our text this morning, I think maybe the best thing I could do is try to explain what we're going to try to do over the course of the next couple of weeks. Uh, I presume if you're here this morning and you don't live under a rock that you know that Easter is just a couple weeks away. And I presume that many of you, probably most of you, would remember that just the other week we wrapped up our time in Colossians. And maybe you're like me and you think, you know, it might just not be a great idea to make a radically upstream decision to start a new book in all things Easter. So we're not going to do that. So what we're going to do, my plan, Lord willing, is to be in Acts chapter 2 on Easter morning. And I'm going to take the next two weeks to set up a truth that is essential to what we're going to see in Acts chapter 2. And I would argue essential, (laughs) very essential to your salvation. So Acts chapter 2, particularly verse 23, I'll start reading in, in verse 22 so you have just a little bit of context. This is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost where he kind of explains everything that's just gone down in the last 50 days. And here's what he says. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through you in your midst as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up. Loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So the phrase that we're going to consider over the course of the next two weeks and a couple of different texts, that phrase in verse 23 that says it was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God that these lawless men crucified and killed the Lord Jesus. The definite plan and foreknowledge of God, which means God had predetermined it. He had pre-planned it. Now, to establish that, we could go to a text like Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, which tells us that Jesus was counted as crucified, as the crucified lamb before the foundation of the earth. But we're not going to do that. We're going to go to two different texts in the Old Testament. We're going to go to one text that's penned about a thousand years before the event of the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And then next week, we're going to look at a text about 600 years but before the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And I would just say to you that as we turn to these different texts, what you're going to see is proof positive that the Lord has a plan. And the Lord's plan includes the suffering and dying of his perfect servant. So if you would turn with me to Psalm chapter 22, the book of Psalms, the 22nd one. The text that we're in this morning uh, was penned by the spirit-inspired author David. David, as I said, lived around 1000 B.C. And so as we turn here, we're going to consider a text that's authored by David in a context about 1,000 years before Jesus comes and lives and dies. What I'm going to do as you make your way over there is I'm, I plan to read this text a lot, like a lot, a lot this morning. We're going to go through it. And so what I want to do is just read us the first two verses, and then I'm going to pray for us, and then we will dig in. Psalm 22, verse 1. David writes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we, your people, come to to this text this morning, Lord, we just pray that you would make us a people who are uh, in tune with you. Lord, that our eyes and our hearts would be open to see what you stored up for us in it. Lord, I pray. I pray that your word would just be expounded this morning in such a way that your people can hear it and receive it and understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so my proposition to you this morning is a very simple one. I'm going to give you a little illustration just to prove it. But my proposition to you this morning is that when you take a text that's penned about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus and this author, this spirit-inspired author, David, when he writes it, it's really a prayer for him. So if he writes it about a thousand B.C. and it's really in response to some of his circumstances, he's really feeling these things. We know this is a Christ-centered text. We're going to see that really clearly this morning. But David means something by these words. So what you end up with is almost two horizons, if you will, two different horizons. I'll explain it to you this way. You know, a lot of folks, there's a lot of talk going on around about spring break right now. Some of our college folks have already been on spring break and our high school folks are about to do that here in the next 
a week or two, and it's got me thinking about vacation. So I want you to just have a little imaginary vacation with me for a minute, okay? Imaginary. So let's just imagine, some because some of you people are like, I don't want to go on vacation with these people. But we're going to have a whole church-wide family vacation. We're going to go, let's just imagine we go to the Grand Canyon. We're going to see the Grand Canyon. So we spend the night in Williams, Arizona, and we wake up really, really early, and we get in our imaginary charter bus, and we drive up to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. It's real, real early. So we get out, and we watch the sun come up. And as we watch the sun come up over the Grand Canyon, we're looking out, and the sun's coming up in the east, and so we're looking out over the east and watching the sun come up, and you know we're taking pictures and saying, man, that's really pretty and all that good stuff. And then we take just a few minutes for about 93% of the ladies and 62% of the men to upload those pictures to Facebook and Instagram so their friends can see what they're doing. And then we head down and we plow through uh, that trail that's going to take us down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And we cross the Colorado River on that suspension bridge. And then we spend all the rest of the day hiking up the other side so that we end up on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. And as we come up to the north rim of the Grand Canyon, let's just imagine it's about that time for the sun to go down. So we who've imaginarily walked across the Grand Canyon because probably all of us wouldn't make it across. Some of you, some of you got hyperventilated just thinking about that, right? But it's imaginary, so it's okay. But we're on the north rim of the Grand Canyon now, and the sun's setting in the west, so we look out to the west and we watch the sun set. Now I just want you to think about what changed in that little illustration there. Our location has only changed just a little bit. We're not that far from where we started walking the way the bird flies, and it really hasn't been that long. Just one day, right? But what has changed is the time's changed a little bit, but our perspective has changed. We're looking at a different horizon. We started out in one location looking at one horizon, and now we're at a different location looking at a different horizon. So what you get to see there, different events, but on, on two different horizons. A lot of the same scenery on two different horizons. And I propose to you, that's what you're going to see in this text this morning. I think you're going to get it rise figuratively. You're going to get to watch the sun figuratively rise and set in Psalm 22, in 40 minutes, maybe. And you won't even have to wear yourself out walking all day. It's going to be great. So here we go. We're going to consider this psalm from Horizon 1, from David's perspective. We're going to see what's going on in David's life. And as we look at what's going on in the life of David, God's servant, I think what we're going to see is going to be applicable to all of us as God's servants. So Horizon 1, here we go. Let's consider first the pain of God's servant. Look again at the first two verses. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. What you see David saying there, what you see David crying out and praying to the Lord there is just very simply, God, where are you? Where are you? Unfortunately, it's, it's easy for us to, to feel like that, right? You're trying to walk faithfully and something goes wrong in your life. You lose someone really close to you. A loved one dies unexpectedly and, and you just find yourself in the midst of turmoil and you say, oh, God, where are you? Where are you, God? Sometimes it's honestly sad how easy this can happen to us, right? Something just throws us off track. We have a bad day. We oversleep. We wake up. We can't get a cup of coffee. We have to go to work. Where are you? God, my day is miserable now. Or maybe we got to work with somebody who overslept and didn't get a cup of coffee. Where are you, God? Whether it's serious or whether it's trivial, we feel like this all the time. Unfortunately, in our fallen condition, we're prone to feel like this all the time. Lord, where are you? In the middle of his despair, what you see really quickly, though, is that David never stops. Never stops trusting the Lord. He, he knows the solution. What's the solution? Verses 3 through 5. Yet you, you, God, are holy. You're enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted. And you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. The solution to this feeling of despair, this feeling of discouragement, this feeling like, woe is me, all things are lost, is God's people, God's servants must know who God is. Even in the midst of our despair, we must know, we must, we must remember who God is. Our God is a God who's able to deliver. Our God is a God who's able to rescue. Our God is a God who does not let those who trust in him be put to shame. 
Even in the midst of his despair, even in the midst of his discouragement, David was able to remember that and pray that. God's people must know who he is. God's servants must know who he is. But even still, not easy. We face discouragement. We face challenges and trials, and we do slip into that despair. Even if we are people who know who the Lord is and trust him wholeheartedly. Look at verse 6. David says, but I'm a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. For he delights in him. Even if we're people who know the Lord and we know the Lord's graciousness and we know the Lord's goodness, it's easy for us to feel like we're the exception sometimes. Easy for us to feel like we're the exception. Uh, don't you hate it when you're sitting at a traffic light and you're behind somebody and the light changes and they just don't move anywhere? They're quite clearly distracted, right? That just burns you up. Right? Can't stand those people. But what about when you're that person? Right? You're the one who's at the traffic light, and you're the one who's distracted, you know, and people are blowing the horn at you and are mad at you, and you're like, whoa, 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 what I'm doing here is important. <laughs> I need to send this text. I need to change the song, right? They say, yeah, when you're that person, you become the exception. I'll tell you what else I can't stand. I cannot stand this. When I'm sitting somewhere on some interstate about 150 cars deep in a line trying to get off in an exit ramp and all of a sudden here comes some joker flying up and they cut somebody off about 149 cars in front of me, I can't stand that. It burns me up. But uh, while I have never, ever done that intentionally, ever, <laughs> let me tell you something. If I'm riding down the road and Siri bust up in my daydream and says, you're about to drive past your exit, I'm just saying, I'll do what I got to do, okay? And I bet you'll probably do what you got to do, right? It's easy for us to feel like sometimes we are the exception. I'm the exception. You're the exception. And I just want to say to you this morning, and David finds this out, in many times, in many ways, you may feel like the exception. You may be the exception, but you are not the exception to God's grace. Not you. You are not the exception to the grace of God. Of God. David is aware of that. He calls that back to mind. And he knows ultimately where his deliverance is going to come from. Where is this deliverance from despair going to come from? Look at verse 9. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. So even as David's in the middle of despair, even as he is distraught, even as he's feeling the proverbial weight of the world on his shoulders and he's tempted to feel like he's the exception, he knows where he ought to look for deliverance from this despair and he knows it because he remembers the Lord's faithfulness. And not just the Lord's faithfulness, the Lord's faithfulness to him. He remembers that God has been good to him. You see in verses 4 and 5, we kind of look back in, in history. We remember what the Lord has done for those who've gone before us. But in verses 9 and 10, we have this direct invitation. Hey, remember, God's been good to you. If we're going to be a faithful people, if we will faithfully be servants of God, we've got to remember God has been good to us. And brothers and sisters, I can tell you emphatically by the simple fact that you're sitting in this room this morning, it is proof positive. God has been good to you. Maybe you feel like you've been dealt a bad hand and you're not where you want to be in life and things just don't seem to, to go your way. But remember, God has been good to you. I'll prove that for you if you'd like me to. If you won't like me to, I'll prove it for you anyway. Um, this morning as we sit here and as we are gathered together to worship the Lord, uh, there are over 3 billion people in the world who are unreached. No access to the gospel. We get more precise, 43% of the world's current population has no access to the gospel. They're unreached. And what I mean by that is the vast majority of those people uh, have no access to, they don't know somebody who's a Christian. They don't know somebody who could tell them the gospel that they wanted to hear. And the vast, vast majority of that 43% don't even know someone who knows someone 
They're two steps from him. They don't even know someone who knows someone that can tell them the gospel so they can take it to them. So as it stands, right here, right now, this morning, 43% of the world's population is unreached. And it is pretty unclear to us how they could be reached unless circumstances drastically change. I'm proud this morning. We as a church are in partnership with people and organizations who are scheming up. How do we reach them? How do we get it to them? Because they need to hear it. They need to get it. They need to know how they can be forgiven of their sin against the holy and just and righteous God whom they don't, they don't even know. They need to know the salvation that's offered to them in Christ. And I'm glad that we're scheming with people to figure out how to get it there. I'll just plug it right here. If you are one of those people who says, you know, I might be interested in seeing what it's like to do what it takes to get the gospel, to get this good news to those people, come talk to me. We've got partnerships that could give you a really clear picture of what it would look like to leverage your life to do that. I'd invite you to do that if you have any interest whatsoever. But after my uh, unashamed plug for foreign missions, like legitimate gospel sharing, church planning, gospel missions right there, I hope I've proven the truth of what I'm saying. God's been good to you. God's been good to you to bring you here and to give you access to his word, let you sit under the preaching of his word and to know people who know the gospel, who can pour it into your lives. Brothers and sisters, God has been good to you and faithful to you and gracious to you. I hope you can see that in your own life. So we've seen in this first, these first 10 verses the pain of God's servant. And in verse 11, we see a transition. We see now the plea of God's servant. Verse 11, David says, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Trouble's near. Trouble is all around. There's no one to help. God's servant feels alone. God's servant feels very alone. God's servant thinks things are bad. God's servant Think, think, thinks that things are really, really bad. Why does he think that? Well, look at verse 12. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lions. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shark, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Yes, things are bad. Yes, things are really bad. The Lord's servant says, hey, I'm, I'm surrounded. My enemies have me surrounded. I am poured out. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me from sorrow, from pain. My strength has dried up. I'm a weak man. I can't deliver myself. And on top of all that, I'm being used. I'm being taken advantage of for my possessions. Yes, things are bad. They are really bad for the Lord's servant, for the Lord's servant. He still knows who can deliver him, verse 19. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. So again, in the midst of his pain and his, and his sorrow and his despair, he, he rounds out his plea here with this just cry, hey, Lord, deliver me. Lord, help me. Oh, Lord, won't you save me? And then in verse 21, he says, you have. You have rescued me. You have delivered me. You, you, you have helped me. And that leads him into praise. Look at the praise of God's servant. Verse 22. I will tell of your name to my brother. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard him when he's cried to him. 
From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Brothers and sisters, I would just say here, I can't read this text without being reminded that it is good for us to praise God. It's good for us to praise God. God delights in the praises of his people. Oh, how we should be a people who praise God. We should tell of his salvation from day to day. And I just want to ask, how are you doing that? How are you in your life doing that? How are you telling of his salvation from day to day? I'll just say this. I've said it before. I'll, I'll say it again. This is emphatically the easiest time of the year to talk to folks about Jesus. There are people over the course of the next month who will have gospel conversations with you, conversations about the things of the Lord, at least, who are not interested in the things of the Lord the other 11 months of the year. But for the next month, you can get an audience with many of those people. One of the, one of the privileges of living in Bible Belt culture, even with all of its flaws, is that we still live in an area and a place and time where people might not know much about Jesus. They might not have darkened the doors of local church in a long time. They might have no idea what's going on in the Bible, but they know Easter is important. They know something important is going on in Easter. And brothers and sisters, I would just say that is to your advantage. So take advantage of it. Use this time, this opportunity that you have with the people that you're around to praise the Lord, to tell of his salvation from day to day at the very least. You can just invite them to church. All people, all decent people invite people to church at Easter. Everybody knows that. If you don't, if you don't get invited to church at Easter, you're like the last person picked on the pickup basketball team. You don't want, right? Everybody gets invited to church on Easter, so just invite them to church. You know, there, there are a lot of CEOs out there, right? I'm talking about Christmas and Easter only type Christians. I don't know if you're like me, right? But uh, I, people poke fun at CEOs. I love CEOs. I'm grateful for CEOs. I want to minister to CEOs. I want CEOs to come and sit in the pews of our church. And we know that as the Lord draws CEOs to sit in the pews of our church, some of those people are going to have their lives changed. Yeah, we got you. We know they're, they're just going to show up. It's social pressure. We got you. Okay. Everybody's supposed to go to church on Easter. Got you. But invite them anyway. Share the gospel with them anyway. Wake up early the next few Sunday mornings and get yourself an extra cup of coffee and get dialed in to come and minister to some people who are just going to walk into church because society says you ought to walk into church around East. Brothers and sisters, praise the Lord. Tell of his salvation from day to day. And I'll just say secondly, it's also as we need to praise the Lord, it's also good for us to hear God praise. It's good for us to gather and to be reminded that we're not in this alone. There are other people who are gathered to praise the Lord along with us. I would just simply say to you, if you're not plugged in in Sunday school, I would encourage you to get plugged in in Sunday school. It's a great place. You can come. You can have small group discussion. You can talk about what the Lord's doing in your life with other people. Have fellowship. Praise the Lord together. That's small group setting. I would encourage you to similarly on Sunday night. Make Sunday night a priority. If you haven't been coming on Sunday night or you're intimidated by Sunday night, just come because we're going to praise the Lord. If for no other reason than to praise the Lord, I would encourage you in those things. It's good for us to praise the Lord, and it's good for us to hear the Lord praise. As we get back into the text here, you're going to notice that David doesn't just praise the Lord for what he's done. It's not just the fact that you rescued me. He praises the Lord for what he's doing and what he has promised to do in the future. Look at verse 27. David, David knows his Bible. He remembers this. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth shall eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done. 
David doesn't just praise the Lord for what he's done in his life. He praises the Lord for what he knows he's doing, what he's in the midst of doing and what he knows is coming. He knows by faith that all the ends of the earth are going to remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations are going to worship the Lord. The Lord is the king. It's good for us to remember that the Lord is the king. He praises the Lord for his kingship. He remembers he knows that the Lord rules over all the nations. He knows the promise made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, that through Abraham all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. He remembers Genesis 22, 18, for through Abraham's offspring all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. There's one coming from Abraham's line, from David's line, who's going to bless all the nations of the earth. And David praises the Lord for that by faith. He knows all these things. He praises the Lord for all these things. He praises that there's a day coming that this good news is going to continue to be passed down. Of people yet unborn are going to know about this and praise the Lord for it. And so he rounds it out and says, the Lord has done it. The Lord has seen fit to accomplish his purposes in salvation. I know he's doing it right now, and I know he's doing it in the future. And so I praise the Lord for that. And that's how David rounds out this song. It's a good time to transition. Right on time. First half is over. All right, so here we go. Now let's consider horizon two. We're going to move from the first horizon to the second horizon. So here we come going in to the second horizon. And now, instead of asking this question from David's perspective or about God's servant, we're going to look at this Psalm, and we're going to ask questions about God's perfect servant. It is hard to read this psalm and not be aware. The New Testament has made it plain and clear that this psalm is a psalm of Jesus. This is a messianic psalm. It's been hard to refrain myself from making that application as we've gone through this far. So I will refrain myself no longer. Horizon number two, God's perfect servant. Let's consider the pain of God's perfect servant. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. It's easy. It's really, really easy for me and you to feel this, for me and you to ask the question, God, where are you at? It's really easy for me, for me and you to, to feel like that. Jesus really was abandoned by God the Father as he hung on the cross. God's perfect servant. For the one time in all of history who's been in perfect fellowship, in perfect harmony with God the Father and God the Spirit for eternity past and eternity present and eternity future. This one moment in time, one time that God the Father turns and pours out his wrath on God the Son. He counted him a sinner who was righteous so that me and you who are sinners could be counted righteous. This really happened. Why have you forsaken me? God, easy for me and you to feel it. It's reality for Jesus. It ain't a feeling for Jesus. God, why have you forsaken me? Don't worry. God's perfect servant never stopped trusting in the Father. Verse 3, yet you are whole. You're enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our Father, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. And you they trusted and were not put to shame. If you remember from earlier, we talked about how important it is for God's people to know God, to know who God is. And I would just point out to you that Jesus knows who God is perfectly. He perfectly knows the character and the nature of God. And he knows that God's a praiseworthy God. He knows that God's a trustworthy God. He knows that God's a God who can deliver. And he knows that God does not let his people be put to shame. And it's still not easy for him. But I'm a worm and not a man. I'm scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me, they mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. We feel this all the time. Easy for us to feel like we're the exception. I would just point out to you that Jesus really was scorned. And Jesus really, really was despised. He really was mocked. He came to his own. 
and his own people didn't receive him. By the time he's on the cross, his friends have abandoned him. As he's on the cross, people mock him. They literally said, they literally said, he trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. If you're, if you're the king of Israel, why don't you come down from the cross and we'll believe you. While Jesus is sitting there dying for the sins of the world, that's what people are saying. I would just say to you, if, if you come here this morning and you feel scorned, just know that Jesus was scorned too. If you feel despised, just know that Jesus understands. Jesus really was despised too. If you come here and you feel like people just mock you and make fun of you, understand Jesus, Jesus knows. Jesus really was made fun of. And Jesus really was mocked. Even in the midst of that, Jesus knew God to be faithful. Not just faithful, but faithful from his own experience. Verse 9. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you've been my God. Maybe you remember the Gospel of Matthew. Maybe you remember when Jesus is coming into the world. Jesus' birth is foretold to this guy named Joseph to keep the family together. Gabriel appears and tells Joseph, hey, here's, what, here's what's going on. Don't divorce Mary. Joseph says, okay. Then maybe you remember as the family is, is there. Maybe you remember that, that there's an angel right, who reveals in a dream to, to these wise men who come to visit. Hey, don't go tell, tell Herod what's going on here. Maybe you remember there's, there's another dream where Joseph then takes the family to Egypt, right, because it's not safe to go home right now. And then maybe you remember there's another dream that moves Jesus back to Nazareth. Brothers and sisters, is there any question that God the Father is governing the incarnation? Is there any question that he's sovereign and he's in control over this? No, there's not. Jesus knew God to be faithful. So even as he hangs on the cross, even as he asks the question, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? He knows God to be faithful. He knows whom he trusts. He knows who he's obeying. And in light of that, he makes a plea. Look at verse 11. The plea of God's perfect servant. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there's none to help. Why the plea? Why? What's the trouble? What's going on? What's so near? Well, many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan, they surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Trouble is near. Trouble is very near. Things are bad. Things are very bad. God's perfect servant is surrounded by his enemy. God's perfect servant is being poured out like water. Jesus' bones are literally out of joint. That's how crucifixion works. His shoulders have been dislocated. Jesus' heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. Fluid is literally pooling up and choking out his heart while he's on the cross. This is not figurative for Jesus. This is literal for Jesus. Jesus has no more strength. He's suffocating to death as he tries to push himself up on the cross to continue breathing. He's out of strength. His tongue sticks to the roof of his jaw. So you're going to hear him say from the cross, I thirst. That's not a show. He's really thirsty. He's lost an incredible amount of blood and his body is telling him, you need fluid. I thirst. They pierced my hands and my feet. Surely I don't have to comment on that. They literally pierced his hands and his feet. I can count all my bones. His flesh, lots of it is missing. Skeletal muscle has been removed through this prerequisite flogging. You can literally see his bones. They stare and gloat 
over him. He's treated like a spectacle. He's naked hanging on a cross and people are mocking him and making fun of him. Treating the Son of God like a spectacle. And they divide my garment. While Jesus is hanging there, dying, people are worried about who's going to get his clothes. And so they decide, well, let's play a little dice game to see who's going to get his clothes. This is literally happening to Jesus. And Jesus keeps trusting God. And Jesus keeps crying out to God. But you, verse 19, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You've rescued me from the horns of the wild ox. So Jesus, here he is, suffering and dying, and he's saying, help. Help me, God. Deliver me, God. Help me, God. Deliver me, God. Save me, God. And then he dies. He dies. And in his death, he's rescued. You have rescued me. In his death, he is rescued. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But don't worry, God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by. Jesus is rescued in his death. Brothers and sisters, me and you are rescued in Jesus' death. This is how the rescue happens. This is how the rescue comes to pass. He's rescued in his death. Me and you are rescued in his death because he was raised from the dead because it was not possible for death to hold him. So we've seen the pain of God's perfect servant. We've seen the plea of God's perfect servant. How does this connect the praise? Verse 22. I will tell you your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. Brothers and sisters, the perfect servant of God is who he is and what he's done. It's connected directly to our praise because me and you can't praise God apart from Jesus. Me and you can't praise God apart from what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. There's nothing to praise God for. We're not even here. All we have is the wrath of God on us. We, we can't fathom rejoicing in the Lord's salvation because apart from Jesus, there is no salvation. There is no way to the Father except through the Son. And there is no way for us to be reconciled to him apart from what he's done on the cross. This is how the pain of God's perfect servant, the plea of God's servant is connected to our praise. And I would just call your attention to verse 24. Verse 24, he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. He's not hidden his face from him, but has heard him when he cried to him. Maybe you remember the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus, here he comes on the night before he's crucified, and he, and he prays, prays really consistently. The Gospels record this for us. He keeps praying, my Father, if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, let it pass. But your will be done. And verse 24 makes it really clear that he, he hears. The, God hears. God the Father hears God the Son when he's praying that prayer. That's what verse 24 says. He, he's heard him when he cried. I don't know if that's ever dawned on you. He, he heard that prayer. And the Father's answer was, it's not possible. God the Father answered this prayer of God the Son in the garden of Gethsemane and said, it's not possible. 
He answered that prayer in accordance with his, with his plan, in accordance with what he's predetermined from before the foundation of the world, in accordance with the good of his people, in accordance with what's going to glorify the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Thanks be to God he answered it that way because he's not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. The, the affliction of the afflicted is dealt with in Jesus' affliction. The affliction of all those who are afflicted can only be dealt with if Jesus is afflicted. And so he's afflicted. He's stricken and smitten and afflicted for us. And so we as God's people have a license to praise him. We have a license not just to praise him for what he's done. But we have a license to praise him for what he's doing. For what he's going to do. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth. They shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth. They eat and worship before him. Shall bow down all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Brothers and sisters, it's good for us to remember that the Lord is king of the earth. It's good for us to remember in particular that the Lord is a gracious king. Now I hope you know that Jesus did not have to come and live and die for God to be king. Not necessary at all. What Jesus had to come and to live and to die for was for God to be a gracious king. If God's going to be a gracious king, Jesus is going to have to come and live and die and make atonement for people. Because God, he tells us of himself, he's a just God. He's God who's merciful and gracious and he's slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He forgives sin and transgression, but he will by no means clear the guilty. And so for God to be the just and holy and righteous God that he is and take sin seriously, somebody's got to deal with sin. So God the Father sent God the Son to deal with our sin. God didn't have to send Jesus to be king. God had to send Jesus so he could be a gracious king. So that he would be just and holy and right to forgive me and you, any who will turn from their sin and trust in the Lord Jesus. He can forgive us of our sin on the basis of what has gone on in Jesus Christ and his crucifixion and his resurrection. So God is the, is the king and not just the king, but the gracious king, the gracious king who rules over all the nations. If you remember, maybe you remember like David, that promise that's been made to Abraham. Hey, through you, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And your offspring, all the nations of the earth, are going to be blessed. Brothers and sisters, that's secured in Christ. That promise is pointing you forward to Christ. This is all wrapped up in who Christ is and what he's done. Sin is dealt with in Christ. God is just and right to forgive any who will turn from their sin and call upon his son. He's just and right to forgive them of their sin and to cleanse them from all their trespasses and to give them eternal life. You can be reconciled to God the Father through what God the Son has done for you. As this text keeps making us think about Jesus on the cross, I just want to remind you of the last thing Jesus said on the cross in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 28. He said, it's finished. It is finished. What's he mean? means the debt's paid. It means the balance sheet has been rectified. You have been reconciled to God. All your sins, if you turn from them and trust in me, have been cast into the sea. It's been dealt with. It's finished. All, everything that needed to be done to accomplish your salvation is now done. It's finished. Any similarities to verse 31? He has done it. Brothers and sisters, he's done it. If you come here this morning and you're saying, I don't know how God could ever forgive me. Maybe there's some way, somehow he could. I just want to tell you, he's done it. It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ in your place. Not your righteousness, his righteousness. Not your sin, his sinlessness. 
This is how you can be reconciled to God. Everything needed to accomplish your salvation, he's done it. Everything needed to be done to secure the praise of the nations, he's done it. Everything needed for God to be a God who forgives sin and still maintain his justices and his, his righteousness, don't worry. He's done it. It's finished. He's done it. What in the world does that lead us to? It leads us back to verse 23. Hey, you who fear the Lord, praise him. Praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. If that's you, if you are counted in that lot, if you are one of God's people, if you've come to know the Lord and you've been forgiven of your sin through the person and work of Jesus Christ, what you ought to do is praise him. Praise him with your lips. Praise him with your life. If you're not in that lot, if you're not one of those people, then as we take some time right here, right now to praise him, then I pray that you might turn and treasure Christ and trust him in your heart today. Pray with me. Oh Lord, we thank you that though we are sinners, though our sin is like scarlet, you've made it as white as snow. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his work on our behalf. We thank you, Lord, that the gospel that you've given us in the scriptures still saves today. And so, Lord, I pray that as we, your people, praise you in this room right now, Lord, I pray that if there are any who, who have not turned from their sin and trusted in you, Lord, would you be at work in their heart, in their lives, by the power of your spirit right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have our song of response. I'll be on the front row. If there's anything you'd like to talk to me about or pray with me about.
Amen. I'll leave you with the last words of Ephesians. If you would, remember that we are going to have our prospective members tonight. They're going to share their, their testimonies with us, get to know how they came to know the Lord. It's going to be a great time. I pray that you, especially if you're a member, will be back here with us to take part in that. All right. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love and corrupt love. I pray that you would go out and live for the glory of Christ this week. Would you sing the doxology with me? Praise God.